Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Hello and welcome to Garden Success. It is good to be back live with you guys and I'm looking forward to talking to you today. This is a call-in show, so let me give you a phone number where you can call us as well as an email if you'd like to perhaps send a picture attached to a question. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or you can reach me by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. And having been away for a couple of weeks now, we had a, a really great uh, recorded show with uh, Dr. Tim Hartman. I hope you all enjoyed that. Tim is always a wealth of information. Uh, and then we had a recorded show with Dr. Mung Mung Gu, uh, who is also a wealth of information. Uh, and now finally I'm back live again. So uh, we've got a pile of emails, and I'm going to start in on those, but please do give us a call and interrupt me on the emails. I think a lot of these email questions are going to be things that other people have as well, which is kind of what we always hope uh, is the case when we're, when we're answering emails. Uh, first of all, Beth had uh, some questions. One was a Dorset apple tree that has some fruit on it. And the question is, uh, what about watering it? How how often do you water it? How do you you know what what guidelines do you have on watering a an apple tree that is carrying a load of fruit? And uh, as I often like to do, I'm going to expand that to just a fruit uh, watering question in general because uh, maybe you don't have an apple, but perhaps you have a peach or a plum or a pear or something else. Uh, when a tree is carrying a load of fruit, you do want to make sure it gets adequate moisture, but you want to make sure the tree gets ad adequate moisture anyway. Uh, the uh, adequate moisture is something I prefer to advise on regarding the soil moisture levels rather than how often or how long you water. Uh, that's true whether it's your lawn or your apple tree. Uh, it, I could say water for 10 minutes once a week, but you know if you have a clay soil, if you have a sandy soil, if you're in the full sun versus a lot of shade, uh, you see what I'm saying. It, it varies a lot. So what I would do is dig down uh, and feel the soil about three inches deep. And uh, this is, a un, a, you know, it's not high tech, but uh, you do have attached to your hand a great moisture meter, which is your hand. Uh, and uh, the uh, feel of the soil, you can tell this soil is moist or this soil, yeah, there's a little moisture, but it, it's not very moist uh, versus dry versus soggy wet. And, and you water accordingly. You want your soil to always be moist. The goal is to keep it adequately moist so there's always something for the tree to be able to draw from, especially when it's carrying a load of fruit. So that may mean watering once a week with a good soaking. Uh, depending on the conditions and the root zone of the tree and everything, it may mean twice a week. It may mean once every two weeks. When we're looking at 100 degree weather, which we are, and uh, that tree is in full sun, uh, I would probably think you're going to water it once a week with a good soaking. Now, a good soaking is a soaking that wets the soil deeply. So if you have a clay soil on a slope and you put three inches of water on, you're not going to even get one inch in that soil because it's all going to run off. 
if you have a sandy soil, it's going to move down very quickly and take the water in much more readily. So sometimes you need to use, uh, my favorite is drip irrigation, low volume irrigation, so that you put just a little bit out and you don't overwhelm the soil's ability to take that water in. Uh, and that way, however much water you put on is how much water gets in the root zone. And you're having to pay for that water. You're buying drinking water to put on your plants, essentially, when you irrigate. And so you want to make sure that you get all the use of it. Uh, if you're going to use a sprinkler, it may mean running it for a little while, turning it off for 45 minutes, letting it soak in, running it for a little while again, turning it off. Or <clears throat> in the case of a larger tree, what I'll often do is run a sprinkler and kind of make a circle around the tree. After it's starting to get wet and a little bit of maybe about to run off, then you move it and you do it to keep going. And by the time you lap that tree, uh, it's time to soak that area again. But the idea is, think of your soil as a bank account. You want to get a nice deposit of water in that bank account that that plant can then draw on for the days to come. The idea of having to water a plant three times a week, something is wrong if that's what you're doing. Uh, now, I, I know in a container, of course, that's different. But if you've got well-prepared soil, a decent soil of any type whatsoever, uh, you ought to be able to give it a good watering and have plenty of water for plants, except the very smallest stature of plants, you know, like something like a little lettuce plant or a little bedding plant flower in, the, in a flower bed. They're not going to have the extent of a root system that a, that a shrub or a tree would, of course. But uh, we, we water too little too often in general, and that's how we waste water on our lawns. But I won't drift into talking about that right now, but a good soaking on an infrequent basis is the best way to water. Now, fruit trees are soon going to be starting the process of setting fruit buds for next year. And when I say soon, I mean in the next two, two to three or four months, uh, that process will be going on. So that, that can happen toward the end of summer and into fall. Um, and you want to have a good healthy tree at that time. That means good foliage so that there's sunlight being captured, carbohydrates being produced, and therefore fruit buds can be set in the plant. And you want to make sure it's not lacking for water at that time, and meaning a drought uh, period. So uh, even though we go through the season, you harvest your fruit, and now it's fall, don't forget that good fruit health is important. In fact, peaches, if you go into late summer and fall and you have kind of decided, okay, I'm done with the season and your tree goes into stress, uh, they'll produce more of those little double fruit, the little twin fruit, Siamese twin type fruit that that uh, are, are two fruit joined together and it ends up not being something that develops uh, properly to make a nice good edible peach. And uh, that is often exacerbated by the fact that we've been going through drought stress when they were setting those, those fruit buds. So again, that was an expanded answer, but I think uh, for a lot of you that have some different types of fruit, it is something uh, to be thinking about. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email gardensuccess at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, let's see we've got an email from elena and elena has uh, grown some potatoes in those grow bags which those of you who aren't familiar it's think of a big felt bag usually they're black not always sometimes brown or they can be colors but um, uh, it's a giant felt bag that you fill with potting soil and grow things in and they're great they they do a good job of growing things she's also grown some in beds uh, planting beds in the ground some of the potatoes are kind of scruffy looking they they just kind of have a scarring look to the outside uh, and uh, when I as I look at the photos it there are different things that can cause that. Um, there certainly there are diseases that can af that affect the potato and the soil and do that. And then there's also a, a potato, uh, and I'm not talking about sweet potato here. I mean the little red potatoes and white potatoes and russet potatoes that we grow. Those are actually underground stems. Those that stem tissue, not root tissue. And so like any stem, it has little breathing openings called lenticels on it. And if you keep your potatoes too wet, uh, those lenticels will swell up and they, they um, uh, it usually rot ensues when you do that. But you can cause uh, a little bit of an unusual look by uh, keeping the things a little too wet. Uh, they need oxygen, they're stem tissues. 
So that may be part of it, and part of it may may be a disease, but it's really hard to tell Elena from the from the photo uh, what I'm seeing. Uh, it's not full-fledged disease-looking materials, uh, so I'm I'm gonna say that it's it's one or the other, or maybe a little of both uh, that's going on. Uh, the potatoes in the bags. One thing about them is they can get hotter. Uh, that if you if you plant your potatoes, and I did this year, a little bit light. And so, you know, you're pushing it on a little further into the season. Uh, those bags, the soil temperature in the bag is going to be a lot warmer, significantly warmer than the soil temperature in the ground in one of your beds. And so it could be a temperature-related thing going on there, too, uh, that's helping with that. I still like those bags, and I would use them for growing a lot of things. Uh, but that, that may be part of uh, what you're seeing. We had an email from Beth uh, about fertilizing in hot weather. When do you when do you fertilize and how do you fertilize uh, or do you fertilize uh, when when the weather is just blazing hot? And I think the the best way to again I, I'm going to expand this one a little bit as we talk about it. But uh, people think of fertilizer almost like um, you know you you're like you're plugging the plant into electricity and it gives it a jolt and it takes off. Uh, uh, it fertilizer is basically the n same nutrients that are underground uh, that are present to the roots when the roots are able and want to take them up. And so when we fertilize, we're again building the bank account. We're not constantly feeding the plant to keep it alive day to day to day. We're putting nutrients in the ground into that soil bank account where it attaches to soil particles and organic matter particles and so on. And that is then available over time. So even if you use a very fast fertilizer, like one of the ones you mix in water, they typically make, you know, blue or greenish water uh, because they're soluble. They're made for using uh, as a liquid feed that you would pour on your plants. Those are immediately there. They're immediately available. Uh, and so even with those, those nutrients do then get in the soil and attach, uh, and, and they give a, somewhat of an, an extended release. But whenever you're using dry fertilizers, whether it's organic, synthetic, whatever, you're putting the nutrients in there, and they're going to be available for a long time. So when we get into hot, hot weather, it's not like we need to add more nutrients at that point in time. Uh, in fact, it may be that the plants are growing more slowly uh, as plants get into drought stress and as plants are affected by heat. And plants do not like 100 degree temperatures. Even plants that survive here in the summer are not fond of that temperature. And you may find that growth slows because temperature affects some of the metabolic processes in the plant. So uh, I would say that in the summer, uh, depending on the plant, you may not need additional nutrients at all. And if you fertilized in the spring, uh, you probably don't need to fertilize again. Now, I'm, I'm doing a, a broad brush there uh, when I say that. Uh, but let's take lawns, for example. With our turf, uh, as with any plant, they are taking up nutrients every day to some degree or another. And so when we return our clippings, that material is decomposing and releasing nutrients. It takes a, a while, but they begin to release those nutrients back to the soil again. If you have trees and shrubs and perennials and flowers and vegetables that are mulched and you don't take the old mulch out, but you just keep adding new mulch to the surface, that surface where it encounters the soil, you're getting a lot of decomposition when the weather gets hot, if there's adequate moisture. You get, it has to be moist. It can't be dry leaves. But uh, So there is a, a, a more rapid release of nutrients going on in warm weather under moist conditions than there would be in the, let's go to the other end of the spectrum, in the wintertime, for example. Uh, and so uh, I would look at fertilizing uh, kind of the way you look at bank accounts. You hopefully have some money goes into the bank account, and then if you need it here or there for this, that, or the other, uh, there's some to draw from. But it's not uh, the kind of thing where uh, you are constantly having to feed to keep the plants alive. There's a lot of nutrients in the soil, and most of what we do in fertilizing most plants in most growing situations is we're supplementing a little bit. 
uh, we are not at all providing everything that plant needs. And so making that mindset shift, I think it, it helps a little bit. Uh, just remember that uh, when you apply fertilizer, you're building the bank account. And if, if you can do it regularly in terms of an annual basis, or maybe depending on what you're growing, like vegetables, you may fertilize in the spring and again in the in the fall, uh, you you maintain that those levels. But we probably put too much on. We probably put more than we need on, especially of some nutrients. I hope that was was uh, helpful. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Uh, continuing on with uh, Beth's uh, question, uh, to, with apple leaves, uh, there's a, a picture, and, and the leaf has uh, burning on the tips and the margins. So you picture a green leaf, and the parts farthest from where the leaf attaches to the stem are turning brown around the edges. That's tip and margin burn. And the things that typically cause that, it's a water issue, uh, but it could be a temporary drought uh, condition. Uh, it could also be excessive uh, salt-based fertilizers in the soil. If you dump a bunch of synthetic fertilizer, most of which are going to be salt-based, uh, on the soil, uh, and, and then that gets taken up as that water moves through the plant and out the leaves, uh, it leaves some of those, think of it as leaving some of the salts behind, and you can get the burn from that concentration of salts near the tip and margins of the leaf. But you can also get it from drought-type conditions or anything that limits the water. So if it was physical injury to the roots or other kinds of things that limit the water getting to the ends of the plant, that could happen. Uh, if it's happening a lot, then I would look at the whole growing area around the plant and, and ask why. Uh, a real droughty, sandy soil and, you know, other kinds of diagnosing may help lead you to what's going on. If it's just kind of here and there, I wouldn't worry about it a whole lot. Uh, but I think that, uh, that that can be common. We also have, and maybe I can get to this today, uh, we also have some some things that can plug the plumbing of the plant. Uh, say that ten times fast. That that plug the plumbing plumbing of the plant and do the same thing that drought would do. Uh, that flow of water and nutrients. You know, uh, our plants that that are adapted to here, they can take the heat, but man, are they ever pumping water in order to 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 do that? And so, if you even slow the water flow uh, through the plant you can end up with some drought stress type symptoms going on. And so I think that that uh, is also part of uh, what's going on, what happens. Um, had a question, uh, a couple of questions come in from, from William, and one of them, and I, I've, this is the first time this year I've had this question, and I've been waiting on it because it, it's just an annual question. Uh, but a tomato plant and the older leaves are curling upward. So if you imagine a tomato, most of the leaves look pretty good, but the older leaves on the plant, uh, it's just like you're cupping your hand around, bringing your thumb and your little finger together sort of thing. It, it's an upward cupping of the leaf, and that's something that happens to tomatoes. Uh, different things can cause it. Excessive nitrogen rates can cause it. Typically, it's it's heat when we get a, a hot spell come in. Uh, it uh, is more of a physiological thing, and it's not a disease. There's not a disease that is causing that particular symptom. Um, the, some varieties are much more prone to that than others, uh, but I would ignore it, not worry about it at all. Certainly your tomato doesn't want to be in 100 degree weather, uh, but we can't change that. But as far as it being something that is attacking, killing your tomato, that uh, cupping is not. Uh, that's not anything to worry about. Uh, also received a photo of a, of a juniper, and we have a lot of different kinds of juniper and related uh, plants. Um, the uh, eastern red cedar uh, is a common one native in this area. There's a lot of junipers that are sold in, for landscapes. Some uh, just have a very upright growth, narrow growth habit. Uh, some are more of a carpet on the ground. But the thing to remember about all of those plants, and I'll just expand that group to also include pine trees uh, of various types, is 
they're able to generate new growth from the base of living leaves, or in this case uh, with pines, needles that they have. And so anything that kills the branch or kills all the leaves on the branch, uh, that branch can't re-sprout. And that's really unusual because you think about any tree or shrub in your yard, you can go out there today with a saw or a pruner or a lopper and cut it off and expect uh, buds to pop out and new growth to come out from below that cut. But junipers, pines don't do that. And so uh, in, when I look at the pictures uh, and I, I see things that look like disease, uh, and there are blight-type diseases that can cause browning of that foliage, uh, spider mites love junipers, and they can cause a browning and loss of the color in the foliage to the point where it dies. Uh, those areas are not going to re-sprout. Now, in the photo uh, that I have, William, the, there are a lot of green sprouts in and among all of the dead. So as long as those stay alive, new growth can come from those and sort of go, as it grows outward and to the side, end up filling in again. So you end up with a nice green uh, outer surface to the whole plant. But anywhere you've got a large area like that, it's not going to fill in. It's, and we, I would say it's always going to be a hole in the plant. And it's one of the reasons why I don't recommend those, you know, like tall Italian cypress type plants that are so popular uh, in a me uh, Mediterranean style landscapes or in the Mediterranean. You go to the look at pictures of Tuscany and it's hard to find a picture of Tuscany that doesn't have a have a, a bunch of tall Italian cypress type plants in it. Uh, but here we end up with. Oh, and I didn't mention um, bagworms. Bagworms are the other thing that takes the leaves off, and when they chew all those little green leaves off, there's no resprouting. Uh, and so you drive around town, and you'll see a lot of those kind of tall columnar plants that are just they just have dead spots, and they're always going to have those dead spots and bare spots. And so that's why I don't recommend them for here, because gosh, you spend ten years growing a big, beautiful line of of columnar plants and then all of a sudden one's gone or one of them has half of it gone or a big hole in the side and there's no fixing it. So I hope that helps. Uh, I think in the case of yours, William, though, that's probably a disease-induced browning, but I wouldn't eliminate spider mites and uh, or possibly bagworms, but I saw no bagworms that were visible to me in the pictures you sent. Our phone number is 845-5689. I know you're not outside wa working in this 100-degree weather, so <laughs> it's time to talk to somebody and quit me stop my droning on. 845-5689 uh, or by email at gardensuccess, that's one word, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U Dot edu. Uh, Anne emailed and asked a question about can you spray the stems of plants where there aren't any leaves uh, with glyphosate or do leaves have to be present to absorb the spray? Well, in general, if you spray like the bark of a tree, uh, the trunk of a tree, uh, it's not going to take up the glyphosate, uh, which glyphosate is the more famous version is Roundup, but there are many other brands out there. Um, it, but if there were a little sprout coming out of the side of the trunk, it, it could affect it. And also, if that trunk tissue is still, uh, think of it more as a fresh green rather than bark covered, uh, then yes, you can you can have damage from the glyphosate. Uh, so, but I I would, uh, you do need, in, in order for those kinds of herbicides, now I don't know whether you're trying to kill a plant or not kill a plant uh, in this question, but uh, if you are trying to, to get rid of a weed, for example, or some other shrubby weed, uh, th that needs to be in an active growing state and you need to be able to get it on, on green leaves or, or at least green, the tender green shoots too. Uh, so when your Bermuda grass goes into major drought stress and it's browning and stuff, and you know it's going to bounce back with the first rain, that doesn't kill Bermuda usually, uh, and you spray it with one of these products that otherwise would be good, it, it's not going to be effective because of the, the fact that the plant is super stressed and not in an active growing rate so or state. So you want to give it a good soaking with water, get it perked up and growing, and then those products are going to do uh, a little bit better job. Hope that that uh, helped. Uh, phone number 
845-5689. Let's talk about some things going on around town uh, here in the area. Uh, let's see the uh, just some announcements on some of the garden clubs and things. The A&M Garden Club uh, will has has stopped their programming for the summer, and they will be resuming again in September. As is the Texas A&M Women's Garden uh, Interest Group. Uh, they are also going to pick up uh, in September. And one more, the Brazos Valley Rose Society. So uh, I don't know who's going to take care of the roses if if the society is not there uh, doing that, but I know they're not. They're home taking care of their own roses. Uh, the Native Plant Society meets every other month, so our next scheduled meeting for it is going to be coming up in July. Uh, but let's talk about a few things uh, for here in June. On uh, June 28th, our Brazos Valley, our Brazos Valley, Brazos County Master Gardeners are going to be having their meetings, which is now again open to the public. Uh, so all these monthly Master Gardener meetings, you're welcome to come in and, and hear the program. Uh, Anne DeLeon, uh, Anne's a professional horticulturist and nursery manager at the Farm Patch, and she'll be talking about designing an English cottage garden in Texas. She'll be sharing her design expertise, her extensive knowledge of plants here in the Brazos Valley. Uh, and uh, Anne's been not only growing but advising people for a long time uh, here in the Brazos Valley. And so if you're interested in maybe just uh, enjoying learning about, if not trying to create your own English cottage garden here in Texas, uh, that's at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, June 28th. There's no charge for that. And it is at the Brazos County Extension Office, our new location for those of you who who used to go up to the Highway 21 location. Now we're out next to the county tax office at 4153 County Park Court. Uh, if you head east across the bypass on University Drive, you're heading out in the right direction. Some other uh, opportunities uh, to talk about on Saturday, June 18th. Our Master Gardeners are going to be doing part of their learning at the library series. And uh, Kathy Paul, one of our Master Gardeners, is going to be talking about my top 10 favorite natives. So if you would like to plant more native plants in your landscape, and uh, what are some of the first ones that you should consider? Uh, well, come and hear Kathy talk about my top 10 native plants. That is Saturday, June 18th at 10 a.m. at the Mounts Library in Bryan. Saturday, June 18th, 10 a.m. at the Mounts Library in Bryan. Uh, going through some of these, if you have gone by, uh, uh, this one's a little further out too, but uh, I'll mention it. Um, uh, the Brookwood community. If you've never been to the Brookwood uh, community, it is a very interesting place down in Brookshire, Texas. Uh, they have a lot of horticulture going on down there, uh, but they also, the, the purpose of the community is providing job training uh, for folks, and it is a uh, uh, it just it's just really worthwhile. I've gone down and spoken there before, and, and uh, I, I can just tell you the setting uh, and everything involved in their programs, it's, it's worth a trip. And it is a trip. It's down in Brookshire, Texas. So imagine heading all the way down to I-10 and just a little past, and that's, that's where you'll be. This is Friday, June 24th, and the topic is Create Your Own Tropical Oasis. It's a lunch and learn. Create Your Own Tropical Oasis at 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. So this is a two-and-a-half-hour program. Now, the speaker is Linda Gay. Now, I, Linda and I have been friends a long time, and I, I don't say this lightly. Uh, Linda's not here to hear it, so it's not just fawning either. But Linda is one of the best speakers and horticulturists that I know. Uh, Linda, at one time, uh, for, I guess, 26 years, uh, she was director of the Mercer Arboretum and Botanical Gardens in Humble, Texas. She's been a garden consultant and a lecturer. I know she's worked with uh, the, the um, Arborgate uh, Nursery down in Tomball. Uh, Linda is, she's good. She, she has incredible knowledge that's, that's uh, based on a lot of experience. And she also has the ability to present. So I guess I, what I'm trying to tell you is if, if you want to hear a good talk, this will be it. Create your own tropical oasis lunch and learn uh, that is at Brookwood Community in Brookshire, Texas, 1030 a.m. to 1 p.m. Friday, 
June 24th. So you need a you need a day off. Make it that Friday and go go check that out. Um, let's see. Uh, she's also oh by the way now she's uh, doing work at the McGovern Centennial Gardens. I see down in Houston. Now, the one thing about the program I haven't told you is it costs $30 uh, plus tax, and but that includes your lunch, uh, which I promise you will not disappoint. Like I said, I've been there. It's a good one. Uh, the talk itself, and you'll take home a two- or a three-gallon tropical plant. Well, you can spend that on a plant just in and of itself. Uh, so anyway, if you want to register for that, you can go to brookwoodcommunity.org. All one word, brookwoodcommunity.org slash events. Uh, so there, there we go. I did not see that coming up in the paper here, so I kind of went on about it. But I'm telling you, I, I, uh, I always, I would go down to, to hear Linda talk because I always learn something. Uh, lots, of, lots of good information. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689. Or by email at garden success at tamu dot edu. While we're talking about out and about, uh, don't forget that we've got our Brazos Valley Farmers Market every Saturday from eight to noon at Main and Twenty First Street in downtown Bryan. Uh, there's the uh, South Brazos County Farmers Market every Friday from noon to five. Uh, across from Scott and White Clinic uh, on East University. In other words, the corner of University and Glenhaven Street. Uh, and then at that same location on Tuesday from noon to 5, there is a farmer's market, the, the South Brazos County Farmer's Market. And then there's Farm Friday out on Tabor Road from 10 to 2 at 2861 FM 974, which we call Tabor Road, uh, and there's all kinds of things available there as well. No excuse not to find out uh, how to get good fresh produce uh, from directly from the grower, if you if you like here uh, in the Bryan College Station area. If uh, you hear a lot of these announcements and things, and you didn't get a pen, you couldn't write them down, I would suggest you go to the Brazos County Master Gardener website, which is brazosmg.org. And BrazosMG or .com uh, website will uh, list in the Around Town calendar, which is on the website, everything we know of that's going on around town. Let's go now and go to the phones. And a number, if you'd like to give us a call, is 845-5689, 845-5689. And we're going to talk to Shannon. Hello, Shannon. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I have a question about my fig tree. Okay. I don't know what kind of fig tree it is, but a couple of weeks ago I noticed it was covered with figs, little tiny figs, and they've since grown about half size. And just um, yesterday I was uh, doing some weeding around it and noticed a couple of figs on the ground and mm -hmm. then a couple of more and a couple of more. And I thought, what is going on? Why are they dropping off the tree? Hmm. And I thought maybe it was something wanting to eat them but they're not even partially eaten or anything it's like it's like the tree is self pruning i mean it still has a bunch of figs on it but huh. there were a lot on the ground yeah figs can under stress conditions they can abort uh, some fruit not not common there's also the possibility of foul play by squirrels or rats or some other kind of thing going in there and messing around with them uh, you might kind of look real close at the, the base of the fig and, and see if it looks like something may have chewed on it or uh, if it just is a real nice clean break uh, like it fell off. That's, a, that's an unusual one. Uh, have the figs done well for you in the past? Yes, but of course I don't usually get very many of them by the time they ripen. Mm -hmm. they're, something else eats them. Yeah. But these are clean breaks. I mean, I, I know what it looks like when it's been munched on. Okay. And usually, often by the birds even, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's like they're just falling off. Yeah, and it almost sounds like it's casting its fruit somehow. And I, you know, I'm going to have to look into that one a little more, Shannon, as to if figs... I don't think of figs mm. as having that natural obsidian layer. Maybe they do. Uh, but, uh, hmm... Okay. Water, does it feel, you feel like the soil moisture level is good around them? It's pretty consistent. I haven't okay. changed anything. I mean, it has gotten hotter, but. Okay. 
Hmm. Well, let me look into that and see if I can find uh, anything else out. I know, I know that there's things that stress figs, like nematodes in the soil that build up over the years, uh, and mm. uh, the drought conditions. And you know, with this excessive hot weather, uh, the demands are really high. So um, it, that's a possibility. Yeah. Um, and then I, okay. I I threw in the foul play, but boy, I don't I don't have a, a good good clean absolute slam dunk answer for you on this one. Okay. Well, I have one other question for you. I have a sure. pineapple plant that um, I've had for several years, and this is the first year that I've gotten a really good fruit from it. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful little pineapple, about six inches. Um, okay. Six to eight inches. It's gotten pretty big. Well, I'm just wondering, should I go ahead and pick it? I mean, how big will it? I, I figured it wouldn't get as big as, like, you see them in the grocery store. Yeah. For how to fruit. Depending on the growing conditions, it, it'll it'll get varying sizes depending on on the growing conditions but I would wait I would wait until it starts to give you a little bit of a turn of color on the outside there uh, and you can go online and, and they talk about you know har harvesting the the pineapples in the time but I would give it huh. as much time as you possibly could uh, and let it let it you know what a ripe pineapple looks like and let it start to, to turn a little bit a little lighter in color because it's really deep, almost like purple right now. And is this a? Do you have a variety name on this by any chance? No. Okay. I, no. Mm -mm. Okay. Well, uh, that that would be my advice on it. Um, to, and congratulations. Not many people can <laughs> fruit a pineapple, even though it could be done. Most people don't take care of it for long enough to get to that stage. Yeah, it's pretty nice. I'm excited. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds good. Well, thank you for the call, and I'll look into that aborted fig thing and see if I can, okay. can find anything else out. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Shannon. All right. Have a good day. Mm, Bye -bye. You too. Bye-bye. Our phone number is 845-5689, and now we're going to talk to Vicki. Hello, Vicki. Hello. I have a problem with armadillos in okay. my garden, in my flower bed, in our yard. Do you have any magic trick to keep them away? No, not a good one. Uh, armadillos, you know, we get into this hot weather and it, the ground is like concrete everywhere out there. And your nice watered yard is a very inviting place, right? Uh, to root, right. root around, and any time mm -hmm. they're going to find some grubs or earthworms or other kinds of things they can chew around on in there, they're, they're going to come in and do that. So your options are to fence them out with a something low. They don't jump fences. Uh, they, you know, didn't take much of a fence to fence out an armadillo. Uh, or mm -hmm. to trap them and relocate them uh, would be the other option. And uh, there used to be, with the Edgar Life Bookstore, I don't know if it still exists online, I'll have to look, but uh, a little publication on armadillos, and it was done by the Texas Wildlife Damage Management Service, and uh, it uh -huh. showed you how to do it. And you use one of those have-a-heart capture traps, you know, like live traps, the long... Yes, we, yes, uh -huh. we have one. We, yes, we well, bought one of those and yeah. <laughs> we catch a lot of cats in it uh not very many not very many armadillos well so. that's true and but but here's what you have to do you you figure out where they're going like every night there are little bumbling things that go along typically they're kind of like bouncing along a, a fence line a, you know if you have a uh -huh. privacy fence or the side of your house and and if you can kind of get an idea of the traffic pattern uh, then you can put two boards that literally funnel them into the trap. <laughs> Just imagine okay. two boards like making a big V coming out of the open end mm -hmm. of the trap. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have heard this before, uh, and, and people swear that it works, but uh, boiling um, elbow macaroni in beef bouillon. Uh, and and oh it, my goodness. and so you're creating this little snack. Uh, I guess it would be kind of a worm-like snack or a grub-like snack. <laughs> uh, and you just drop one here or there. I mean, don't you know? Don't fill them up before they get to the trap. But you can uh -huh. lead. You can kind of lead them in that way. And you know, once you get them in the trap, oh then goodness. you're in better shape. So um, if we got any wildlife damage management specialists out there, uh, once you get through holding your belly rolling on the ground laughing at hearing me <laughs> say all that, please call and correct me. But no, seriously, I think that I think that may be the best. And if you can't find the publication, 
call us at the AgriLife Extension Office here in Brazos County, and I will. I have a, I have copies of the old one that have a little diagram of how they recommended doing it. Okay. Well, I'm going to try the macaroni and the, and the board. So maybe okay. we will catch an armadillo instead right. of a cat instead so of cat. The 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 secret to that though is knowing where they're going because you know they're not going to go around this long V to find the way in. I mean, right. it, so you're right. you're right. basically taking a little bumbling creature and and leading them in. Okay. Well, we will try that. Thank you so much for the information. All right, Vicky. Thank you for the call. Okay. Uh, our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, Michaela uh, emails a picture of a blackberry plant uh, that uh, she's not real happy with, uh, not super, super growth. It looks a little sickly. And again, what we're seeing on it is that tip and margin burn, uh, which is an indication of a soil moisture problem. Uh, so uh, I would, uh, I'm going to guess that it's not an excessive amount of fertilizer salts, but in this case, maybe a little bit of a droughty condition, a lack of moisture. I guess, you know, it's also possible that if you overwater in a clay soil and you cause uh, roots to uh, lack oxygen and die, that could then be followed by a drought kind of condition because there's no roots to take it up. They, they were killed. Uh, but that I don't see anything that's disease-like on those plants. Uh, I would give them a little bit of boost of fertilizer if you don't know the soil condition. Uh, not a lot, but, uh, but a little sprinkling. Get you a lawn-type fertilizer, maybe a, a quarter cup in about a, oh, I don't know, four foot across area. Uh, of the of around the plant, maybe let's say two or three feet out from all directions, watered in really good, a good soaking, and uh, then just check that soil moisture and make sure it it stays moist. Again, remember uh, everyone listening on all kinds of plants, where w- the demands are super high, and the super hot weather stresses these plants. They just aren't made to be able to function in super, super hot conditions, and they sort of shut down and go on hold. So there could be a number of different things going on here. In fact, that that's one of the things that affects uh, our ability to grow more northern plants. You know, maybe you move from the Midwest and you love lilacs and want to grow them down here. Uh, it's not, it is the temperature, of course, uh, but it sometimes it gets really hot and uh, you just end up uh, with a plant that is not able to, uh, to function in, in those kinds of temperatures. Uh, the physiological things start to shut down. Um, I got an email from Tad about uh, regarding that uh, figs dropping. And uh, at one time they had a, a septic field and uh, some figs were growing there. Uh, they were in septic lines and got good plenty of food and all of that. And then in, in August, things dry out. Uh, and the figs would begin dropping. So that, that kind of goes back to that drought stress uh, theory. Thank you, Ted, uh, for that. Uh, so maybe on your, on your fig, uh, Shannon, that you called about earlier, uh, just to put another emphasis on that idea of, of uh, give it a good deep soaking and make sure it's getting adequate uh, soil moisture uh, on, on a, a frequent enough basis to, to keep it from uh, drying out. That's a that's just, I tell you, I was out uh, the other day. I've got a couple of plants that every day I just am watering them almost every day. Trying, they're in a small area where they don't have a lot of root zone. And as a result, they, uh, they're they really struggling along. And I know that breaks the rule I just said. I don't water every day. But <clears throat> for these plants with a confined root zone, uh, they're, they're having uh, to do that. Uh, let's see. We talked about... Let me go back to the emails one more time now. Um, William, or Bill, uh, has a question. Uh, he has some cigar plants, the candy corn type, uh, that have been almost defoliated by swarms of tiny black beetles. They fly really well around. And uh, there's a lot of other ornamentals and vegetables, but for some reason they like the cigar plant. And getting a picture of them is about 
uh, impossible, and I, I know what you're talking about. There are several small types of beetles that are out and about right now and really doing havoc. And one of them, uh, there's a flea beetle, and it's named because they literally can jump uh, like their hind legs are able to take off. Uh, the flea beetles are small and black, and they eat holes in plants. It makes it look like you shot it with a shotgun with all the little holes in them. Uh, and then there is the yellow margin leaf beetle. Uh, there's cucumber beetles, both spotted and striped cucumber beetles you find around the country. And uh, so when when you're dealing with beetles, you pretty much any insecticide is going to do a pretty good job. Most of the synthetic pyrethroids or pyrethrin, uh, those kinds of things are going to do a good job. Uh, if you're looking for something a little organic, there there is a product, and you may have to mail order it. I don't know that I've seen it locally. It may be available locally, but it's a type of BT. Now, now BT we normally think of as caterpillar killer, and it is. BT is, but that is one strain of the bacterium. There are uh, uh, there is a strain. Uh, I believe the caterpillar one is called Kerstaki strain. The um, uh, one for some leaf eating beetles is a San Diego strain. Uh, but when you look at the package, it's not going to have pictures of caterpillars on it. It's going to have pictures of beetles. But the it's Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, and the strain is San Diego. And it works on some, not all, leaf-feeding beetles. So if you were trying to do it organically, uh, that would be one I would give it a shot. Uh, and I, I don't know the list of every leaf-feeding beetle it does or doesn't work on. Uh, but that would be one I would I would try. Uh, if not, you're going to have to shift over to some sort of an insecticidal dust or uh, insecticidal um, uh, spray uh, to, to shut that down. This may be a pest that is just going to go through and then move on. Uh, and then again, it may not, Bill. So uh, that's interesting that you say that. I had not noticed that candy corn plant had a pest problem like that. In fact, as I think about it, I don't know that I've ever heard of anyone having this problem before. Uh, but uh, while we're talking about plants, uh, last week, I believe it was last week in Friday in the Eagle, uh, in my column I talked about some plants that do well in the summer. And uh, one of them was the firecracker plant, which is also, it's a kufia genus. And uh, the candy corn plant uh, is also a kufia genus. And the term cigar plant is used, unfortunately, for both of them. Sometimes one's called cigarette and one's called cigar. Uh, but they're, they have tubular, long red blooms, maybe red at the tip or orange at the tip, uh, but the candy corn is gets a much bigger, much larger blooms and much taller plant uh, than uh, the um, uh, one we call cigar plant or firecracker plant. Uh, David Verity is a, a cross, and it's it's one that's real popular around here. Uh, but anyway, I I think those are great plants. You ought to you ought to go for them. Uh, they they really can take the heat, but they do need some some moisture. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And let's see, let's go back uh, to the emails again. Um, so Elizabeth has a picture of plant that is in a bed of milk and wine crinums. If you've never seen, by the way, milk and wine lilies, they are um, interesting plants, extremely tough. Their bulbs, and boy are they ever bulbs, they can get, I've seen them all, I've seen them the size of a volleyball before, uh, eventually as they get older. Uh, and they, they're really, really uh, dependable uh, bulbs and have beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, foliage as well, and I'm having trouble now picking picking the plants out of the photo. Uh, but I tell you what, if if you can ever get those things to um, to bloom, I may have to take a little bit uh, closer look in order to be able to see uh, what you have here. But the the um, the best way to identify any of these bulb-like plants, and boy, that sure does look like a milk and wine. Uh, crinum to me uh, there, Elizabeth, in the photo. Maybe we should continue that conversation offline uh, until I can get a little bit more information uh, from you on that. Uh, th we're, we're, you know, we are in the heat of summer, and, and this is a time of year when uh, the demands on the plants are really high. Uh, so finding that right amount of mo soil moisture is really important. We can plant plants year-round here. Uh, 
the best time to plant shrubs, trees, and perennials is in the fall, and then in the winter, and then in the spring. And so summer is the least uh, uh, appropriate time to plant, but you can. You can put a plant in now. Uh, you want to check the root ball before you put it in. Make sure that you've cut the outside roots, loosened them up uh, so that it, they're not winding around in the container. You put it in the ground, but, but when you put it in the ground, remember this. As far as that plant's concerned, it's still in a container. Its roots are still in a cylinder. And the soil around them can be moist, and within a day, that root ball is pumped dry because that's where all the roots are. That's where they can take up water and nowhere else. Day by day by day, week by week, and even month by month, those roots move outward into the soil around where the plant originally went in the ground. And it becomes more and more resilient. But the challenge with summer planting isn't that it can't be done. I mean, there's plants sitting at garden centers all over town right now in pots being watered every day, maybe twice a day, and they're fine. You just have to get them home and treat them the same way. And finding out how to keep them moist without overwatering them and having them soggy is the challenge. Because when you put that plant in a clay soil, now you have an underground bathtub you've dropped it into and you fill that up with water. And where's the water going to go? It's, it's not going to go very rapidly down into that clay soil. That's a very slow percolation. And so... That's the challenge with uh, our summer planting. In a container at the nursery, the container had holes in the bottom. They could water all day from the top, and the excess just runs out the bottom. But when you put it in the ground, especially in a clay soil, there's not that place for it to go. And so if you can take care of your plant and water it with a little bit of water, you know, the opposite of normal plant care. What is normal? Deep and infrequent soakings. Now we're taking a new baby plant where we're giving it little bitty drinks of water until it can get its roots established uh, and you can have success. So I'd like to mention that just because I always talk about uh, planting in the fall and the winter and the spring. And uh, if you know, it, I have some plants that I'm putting the ground yet. I got the other day. I, you can do it. And, and you don't want to wait that long to get something in. You're in the process of some renovations. Go for it. Just to remember how to how to take care of them and give them that care. One other thing that uh, is not a question, at least that I've run across in the emails today. And by the way, uh, having been gone now for a while, I uh, do have a backlog. And so, if you didn't hear your question answered today, or you don't hear it answered today, just hang on. We we will get back. Uh, I will get back to you and and give that give that uh, answer uh, here. But. One of the questions I'm I'm getting a lot, more than I think I ever have, is people talk about little insects that are about a half inch long that when they sit on the on the plant stem parallel to the stem, and then they when you put your hand out they or when you walk up they run around the other side of the stem. And it's kind of like a squirrel will do on a tree. You know, have you ever seen a squirrel on a tree trunk and you walk around and as you walk around, the squirrel keeps hiding from you on the other side? These are sharpshooter insects, specifically the one we're seeing a lot of now is the glassy winged sharpshooter. And the glassy winged sharpshooter uh, is an insect that feeds off the sap of the plant. The other thing that people say when they call is, I'm walking under my crepe myrtles or some other oak tree or something, and it feels like it's raining on me. And that that is being produced by that insect. So whereas scale and um, uh, white flies and, and uh, let's see, what else, aphids, they're feeding on phloem types of tissue that have a lot of sugar that have come from the leaves. Uh, and so when they release their honeydew, that is where we get that black sooty mold because it's a sweet sugary uh, bug pea, uh, to just put it bluntly, uh, on the on the on the plant. It falls on the surface of the plant or in your car or your picnic table or whatever's underneath. This is different. The sharpshooters are feeding on the xylem, the interior tissues. Uh, or the interior plumbing, rather, of the plant. And this is the, the moisture that's coming up from the roots. So it's basically water and nutrients uh, as opposed to all the carbohydrates. And, and so it doesn't cause the honeydew, but they have to drink a lot of it to get adequate nutrition. And in doing so, there's a lot of it going in 
well, what we would say is big drops outside the back end of the bug. And so you walk underneath and you feel that mist. And, and uh, that. so I actually wrote about this for tomorrow's Eagle Gardening column, uh, for those of you who read that. Uh, but I will focus on it. Uh, but people get very alarmed because oftentimes you see these on a plant and the plant looks very sick or the plant looks wilted. And while their feeding does take some moisture out of the plant, uh, they are not an, in their feeding activity is not in and of itself the problem. Uh, they typically are not going to kill a plant or even severely weaken a plant. But there's a big but, and that is that um, they can carry a disease from one plant to another that is a bacterium that plugs the plumbing. And I mentioned early in this show today that uh, things that plug the plumbing and slow the flow uh, up from, up from the, the roots up to the top, uh, that then would result in tip burn, margin burn, and wilting, uh, which would all be what we would think of as drought-like symptoms or lack of water symptoms. And so these glassy wing sharpshooters are feeding in the xylem and they put a bacteria in the xylem that gums up the plumbing and creates that drought symptom. And it, it happens on a lot of plants. And I've seen I've seen this scorch type symptom that they cause on red buds and a lot of different things in very small minor degrees. But when it gets on an oleander, it seems to be especially bad. Oleander leaf scorch can be can be significant. And the number one problem that it is for us, and really now it's across mar large parts of the southern part of the country, is uh, on wine grapes. Uh, and it causes something we call Pierce's disease on wine grapes. But it's the reason you don't see a lot of the more famous wine grape varieties growing here uh, in, in this part of Texas. Uh, and it, it's because the disease and the insects are prevalent here, and it just doesn't take long before the, a new planting gets a problem uh, from them. And so uh, w from your landscape standpoint, though, aside from a few plants, oleander and, and wine grapes being two of the more common ones or more likely ones, uh, these pests are just not a, a problem to worry about. They've been here for a long time. They've been doing this for a long time. For some reason, there seem to be more of them this year. Uh, for some reason, people are calling and emailing and, and everything else about them more this year. Uh, but uh, they, they will go away in time. They have their natural enemies. Now, you can spray all over the plants and kill them, as well as kill a lot of the good things that are out there. You can put systemics in the ground, and it goes up in the juices of the plant and kills them. But it also gets to the blooms. And, and uh, honeybees, one of their number one things in the summer is crepe myrtle pollen and, and nectar. And so you, you need to not uh, probably be using those kinds of things, especially on a pest that is not going to kill your plant. So that's kind of the in a nutshell on those. Um, so I know we've kind of run out of time here today, but I, I hope it's been uh, informative for you. I will get to the rest of your emails here uh, within the coming week as we go into next week's show. But tell your friends about the garden show, and hopefully we'll have some more folks listening and be able to uh, enjoy the conversation and hear from you as well. Thanks so much, and see you, or talk to you guys next week. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209.